Hello, KCIW listeners, and welcome to Curry Cafe, where we put together a panel of volunteers and guests who discuss various topics from whimsical and fun to more serious subjects. Welcome to another edition of Curry Cafe. My name is Ray Gary, and for the next hour, I'm going to be hosting two other people with me here, and we're going to be talking about the significance of music on the world. And I hope each of you appreciate the fact that we're all in here on a beautiful sunny day when we would rather be at the beach. <laughs> but here we are, sacrificing once again for the KCIW listener. Now, uh, get a pen ready. Or if you don't already have one, because in today's show, you're going to be able to get in touch with us live on the radio at 541-661-4098. Once again, 541-661-4098. Operators are standing by. So let's go around now and uh, have everybody introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Kathy Justman again. Uh, sitting in for I'm sitting in Shirley's chair, but uh, time for the next guy to introduce himself. Okay, hello everybody. Rick McNamara here, volunteer at KCIW, and I'm not so fond of the big breeze, so I'm glad I'm here and not on the beach. Oh, <laughs> pretty well, windy out there today. You know, I wake up every morning and I think, well. What am I going to be able to get done today? And I have indoor work. I can work on my Model T, or I can do outdoor work, or I can do nothing. And today is just a perfect day for outdoor work, and I'm in the mood to do it. And I bought a bunch of plants yesterday that I, but as I said earlier, I am dedicated to sacrificing myself to KCIW listeners. Now, if you want to be a KCIW participant today, you can call at 541. 541- Six six one four zero nine eight, and send us a text. Tell us what you think of what we're saying, or or whatever you want to do. You might just want to say hi and tell us what you're doing on a pretty day at the beach. Okay, so uh, in preparation for this show, I have done a significant <laughs> amount of um, of research. Uh, some of my research, in fact, just ended last evening at. Uh, one of the local bars where I experienced the Sharks for the first time. If you're a surf music fan or a fan of guitar music and that kind of stuff, uh, the local band, I'd never heard of them before, but I guess they've been around a while, and I'm just recommending you go see them. Okay, going back past the Sharks, way back, way, way, way back to... So far back, we didn't have days yet. We didn't have dates yet. We didn't have anything. It was just a long, long time ago. The, the band was sitting around, not the band, the, the, the group of, I guess they're people or soon to be people, were sitting around the fire and they realized they were running out of wood and it was time to start cooking dinner. So they sent Og out. Og was one of the uh, the, the, the female members of the band to go get some firewood so that we could could uh, cook up our mammoth la, la, liver. <laughs> so she went out and she's picking up these logs and trying to get a big handful or armful so that she can make the trip worthwhile and not have to go out with a saber-toothed tigers or everything by herself again. So anyway, she drops one of the, the, the pieces of wood that she's holding and it lands on another one. And the one that's on the ground is a log and it's hollow and she realized it made a kind of an interesting sound, not just like dropping on the ground or something. So she picked it up and, and uh, dropped it again on the log in a slightly different place, and it made even a different sound. So she did that a couple of times, different pieces of wood, and she said, this is amazing. We can, we can really do something fun with this. So she snuck back to the band where everybody was sitting around the soon-to-be fire and got a couple of the other ladies and showed them what she discovered. And lo and behold, in uh, just a few minutes, each one added something else, added a different sound, hit a different part of the log. One actually picked up a rock and hit the log, and oh, wow, that's a whole nother sound. So they worked on it for quite a while and started to develop what later became uh, Broadway show music. (laughs) And they were, um, it's hard to say when, you know, they didn't even have days yet. They didn't know if it was Saturday or Monday 
and they were pretty ignorant people. Um, let me catch up here now. <laughs> so after a while, the men sent somebody to to, uh, <laughs> to go get the ladies back with the wood because they're getting hungry. They wanted to get that that mastodon liver eaten. But Og was not ready to give up. After dinner and the next day, she snuck out of uh, the band with uh, her girlfriends again, and they worked more and more on some music. Mm-hmm. What well, they, they didn't even call it music yet. They were, but they they knew they they put together a little story, and um, it was a good story, and everybody kind of liked it. But copyright laws were not very good in those days, so the the story is lost to history. We have no idea what it was. It got homogenized into several other stories, and but we have a pretty good idea that it that it was uh, it started with uh, boy meets girl. Uh, boy falls in love with girl, girl mm-hmm. leaves boy, they get back together again, and that's, you know, the, your, your basic rom-com. That was probably the very first rom-com. Mm-hmm. So anyway, as as time went on, um, we we meet the wandering minstrel. And the wandering minstrels used to travel, well, okay, well, before we had this, these little bands, and now we're no longer hunters and gatherers as much as we are farmers, and we have these little towns where we all live and stay and don't go out in the woods to look for mammoths anymore. But they're kind of spread apart. They might be a day or two's travel apart. So somebody came up with the bright idea that I can make money going and entertaining these people. And the the wandering minstrel was invented. And he would go from town to town and juggle, and it might have a band of those. And uh, and it, uh, along with doing that, he brought the news. So he brought the news from one town to the next, and, and people kind of knew what was going on around them. And they paid him with whatever currency they 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 could pay with. And one day, in the uh, in the audience, these two guys were there listening to the the music and hearing the news from coming from someplace else, and. They realized that that news really didn't change a whole lot every day, maybe a little bit of a difference, but they said, you know, we could we could liven this up a little bit by making our own news. We could make up stories that are a bit more salacious and people would be interested in, in hearing. So they formed their own wandering minstrels, and they just flat-ass told lies. They said that the... Uh, the Princess was really a man, things like that, and uh, boy, they started getting a following, and uh, they learned that people will believe just about anything. Sounds like you're inventing vaudeville. <laughs> no, I'm inventing Fox News. Or inventing... <laughs> oh my, that that is vaudeville. Yeah, if so, you didn't notice. <laughs> so anyway, that's my story of 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 how music started, how we got into it, how we distorted people's beliefs I, with, with music and menstrual shows. and mm. Yeah, I saw a documentary with another story about the uh, people who moved to Australia 50,000 years ago, but they had a real close association with the, the sea, even though, because they all lived on the coast. They had to live on the coast because the center of Australia was so dry. and um, coast is where the food is. And the coast is where the food was, yes. And um, it's strange that they arrived in boats. They must have arrived in boats, or maybe they have arrived on logs, but they never left. You know, once they got there, they stopped using boats and they just lived on the shores of Australia. But they would stand on a cliff and watch the whales migrating. And those whales were humpback whales, and those whales were singing. And so the people of Australia, the Aborigines, they made instruments to make sounds like the whales. And then those Instruments became part of their ceremonies, and they wanted to see the whales every year when they were swimming by, and that became part of their cycle of life, to see the whales and sing their songs. Mm. Well, both you guys, have, uh, Ray and Kathy, have cleared up the mystery for me of uh, from music. <laughs> so we'll, I, we'll have to find something else to kill the rest of the hour. <laughs> <laughs> But no, all, why all do we, we love it so much? We're well, we talking about have. what a nice day it is or the plants right, right. All right. All why I do we was... love why do we love music so much? Now we need to talk about that. Well, yeah, we will, but like I said, for me, I just I wrote down it's always intrigued me to go back into prehistoric times with Og, 
Oog and all the rest. What, yeah, what was the first time that somebody, oh, we'll never know, of course, but uh, we can guess that from a bird singing to the rhythmic sounds of nature dropping something or, you know, the wind coming up and flapping, it, it is amazing that it went <laughs> from there to where we are now. I mean, we've got so many intricate instruments and wonderful sounds, it, it, there's a lot of there in between. Yeah, um, I'm sure that uh, music promoters had a lot to do with that. The same music promoters we were talking about before the show started, about how uh, Jimi Hendrix opened for the Monkees. Yeah, doesn't quite Surprising fit. Surprising a lot of very young children and their parents, right? <laughs> yeah, Monkees fans at that time were uh, eight and ten and twelve year olds, and I was one. Went to the shows with their parents, <laughs> probably. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Didn't see the Monkees, but uh, I, I did go when I was. Oh gosh, I have to think. Uh, probably about eleven. My parents took me and a couple of friends. My first concert was the Rolling Stones in Sacramento. Oh, wow. The little memorial. Uh, they weren't, you know, so big at that time. But uh, that was my first concert, and wow. it was pretty, pretty cool. I thought, I boy, I'm really grown up. And then right after that, then we formed our little garage band, and there you go. My first concerts were in uh, in New York. Uh, Alan Freed and Bruce Morrow did um, had concerts at the New York and Brooklyn Paramount with uh, all the duo bands and groups, and so they were they were. I'm thinking back, they were kind of odd. The show would have like 10 names, 10 big doo-wop names. And they would come out and do one, maybe two songs, and that's it. They were gone. Uh, it, it just seems strange to me now that there'd be show, shows like that. Jerry Lee Lewis come out and sing two songs. He's gone. <laughs> I little, think... little, little Richard would sing this, his last song, he fell into the band and all that. I think that my first uh, live music that wasn't church music, um, kind of a mediocre organ in the congregational church, um, was a marching band in a Memorial Day parade, and I was in a Girl Scout costume, and we were all marching. And when I heard that live band, it stirred my blood, you know, especially the drums. I liked the drums so much because I could feel them. I could feel they. They changed, my blood vibrated, my vo bones vibrated, and I wanted to hear live music all the time when I heard that band, and I would, since then, seeking out live music every day of my life. One of the, one of the things I learned from uh, from music, a lot of things I learned, I, you know, I thought that was, that was the story of life, that's how you're supposed to um, act, <laughs> get on women, what to expect, that type of thing. But prior to doo-wops, we used to watch the Ed Sullivan show every Sunday night, I think it was, and he always had his token black performer, or sometimes more than one. And I was, like most white people at that time that lived in white communities like I do, under the mistaken impression that all black people could sing and dance. <laughs> and uh, I can remember my first job, I, 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 I worked with a black guy, he, I don't know if he could dance, but he certainly couldn't sing, but that did not stop him from trying. Mm. He was awful. <laughs> but then we, you know, we started to uh, to get involved with the doo-wops, and, and white people and black people were getting together a little bit. We were finding ah, out yeah, that all those stereotypes band. were not necessarily true. Yeah, they were mixed bands, and we saw them on TV, on American Bandstand, and and uh, shows that were on past my bedtime, like I said, they were, Harry, Harry, it was Harry Belafonte had a show briefly. No, Nat King Cole had uh -huh. his own show briefly. But because all the southern states dropped their um, sponsors, he was only on there for one brief season. Uh, the southern states weren't going to watch Harry Belaf um Nat King Cole on TV. So, um, well, the I, I, yeah, you you mentioned American Bandstand. I don't think that was a very good example of. Uh, of the races getting together because you never saw, there were never, no no black um, dancers. No, you're right. Somewhere and, I saw the combo bands that had mixed races. And that was probably not until later. It wasn't in the 50s. You know, I think it was when I was in junior high school or older that I, 
actually saw mixed bands on TV. Uh, but I did watch American Bandstand, and you're right. They featured white singers. So, But dancers, they did have uh, Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and people like that on. And, well, they're both dead yeah. now. But they did credit him with being on the show, even even though they were the only black people there. Yeah. Yeah. And the kids dancing were from their high schools and the local high school. And there was maybe one black couple once in a blue moon dancing among the white kids. <laughs> Now, Alan Freed, who, mm-hmm. who uh, had a show at the same time that came from a, a local station in New York, and uh, Alan Freed brought r- rock and roll to the forefront. Uh, well, go back this story in uh, Cleveland. He had a show, a, r- a regular people's show, and, and he would start working in what were called rhythm and blues songs into his show, and they became very popular. And the show became very popular. But then, now this was playing black people on a white radio station. Mm. Uh, and it worked. It all worked. And then he came up with the name Rock and Roll to make it a little less, a little more acceptable than rhythm and blues, which was, mm. was black people music. They called it race music. Race yeah. music, yeah. So, <laughs> well, our, uh, we're pretty much generally the same age. As I said, the 60s was pretty turbulent time and and into the 70s. But I think, and I happened to go to a junior high that was pretty racially diverse, so introduced to a lot of uh, black and white music. But I think it that's what I thought we were coming together at that time. I know there was still a lot of trouble with riots and stuff and police, and so, of course there still is. But well, the music- was the age of Aquarius. Well, you know what? We, you know, we're had, so happy uh, now that people are finally getting the- we had high ideals, I think. <laughs> but a lot of that stuff, uh, the crossover race, it's kind of difficult to talk about maybe, but I'll just say it. But there was that kind of went through a happy time for me with uh, the Temptations, the OJs, um, <laughs> all of that. So it was just kind of happy music for, for quite a while. Even Marvin Gaye, although I know Marvin Gaye uh, would tap into a lot of protest stuff, and, and he did it wonderfully. But I thought it was a time that we were starting to come together, and right now, I, I it's hard to say right now. Um, you know, um, I mentioned Marvin Gaye uh, at, the, at the time. Motown was just basically Motown, yeah. dance music and opera music and music that was made to sell. And I've heard two stories about about the What's Going On album. One, that he did the song, and um, I can't think. That's a Dave Barry. Who, what was the name of the guy who was? Oh, yeah, I can't remember. I can't remember. I I heard that he liked the song and told Marvin Gaye to make an album. But I also heard that he made the album and uh, the head of, uh, what's the... <laughs> Senior moment here? Yeah. What happened? Uh, of, um, anyway, the, 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 the music album, he, uh, he didn't, didn't want it released. And that, and they they released it anyway, and it, it sold fifty five billion copies in about a twenty or thirty minutes. I Is that the What's Going On? What's Going On? Okay, it's one of the greatest albums of all time. I yeah, think. I agree. Every song on it, and the way they blend them all together, and uh, the the words, and he uh, Marvin Gaye certainly wasn't the first one to to do protest music. There was a lot of it going on by then, but he wanted yeah. to he wanted to be saying something. He didn't want to just sing dance music. Yeah. Um, and of course, we're talking about mu- the effect on society in general, history, and all that. My brief, uh, I had a lot of music events in my life, and it started out young with my dad playing the country albums that he loved, Marty Robbins and Johnny Cash, and I was probably four or five and just listening to that stuff. And um, then it, that coincided with one of my uh, female girl cousins was a fan, of course, of the early Elvis. And then she was over one time, and El- I don't remember the program, but watching Elvis, and that as a young kid, of course, watching her reaction, and I thought, wow, this guy is pretty pretty cool, pretty different. Yeah. Now, I'm not a fan of the later Elvis, but I think that was a big moment in music history, if you will, and it certainly was for me. And then after that, now Ray might cringe a little, but... The Beatles on Ed Sullivan was a huge moment for me. That's when yeah. 
everybody in my neighborhood, that's when the, the garage band started. And uh, uh, I, yeah, I've always been a big fan. I think that opened the floodgates to, well, the British invasion after that. A lot of good stuff out there. David David Crosby said that that uh, caused him to start start the birds, uh, the Beatles, the Beatles. Yeah, and oh, the Hard okay. Day's Night, and okay, they all went out and bought whatever the guitars were. Okay, that, that okay. The, uh, yeah, the Beatles used. And then this is weird, but around the same time, the Beverly Hillbillies came on TV. It's the first time I had heard bluegrass music. Oh uh, yes, Flat and Scruggs. Flat and Scruggs. And that's uh, again a suburban kid. Uh, uh, love and bluegrass. It, it's not like I was out in the hills of Kentucky drinking moonshine, but that music has always intrigued me, especially mm-hmm. the five string banjo and the fiddle. Uh, so anyway, kind of an eclectic uh, taste, I suppose. But and then there was a t- one more game changer with the uh, country music was. Uh, I never was a Merle Haggard fan. The early Merle Haggard. My dad loved him. Blah blah. But I went to a Outdoor concert. I was in my early twenties, and it was Willie Nelson, Emmy Lou Harris, and Merle Haggard. And I had the thought that, well, I'll go there. I'll listen to Willie and Emmy Lou, but I'll shut down Merle. He put on one, uh, just a wonderful show. From then on, he he played various instruments. Just the talent, and he had a unique voice. I, I became a Merle Haggard fan after that. So, kind of changed my opinion there. I got to see Merle Haggard by accident. I heard uh, when that when that song was out about um, Oki from Oki from, from Muskogee. Uh, Muskogee. Right. I heard him interviewed one time about that, and and he said, "Well, I was in Vietnam when that came out, and 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 um, Armed Forces Radio had the country western hour, so all of us guys from New York left when the if the radio was on, and they we called yokels, Texas people, and we'll listen to that, and but they liked that song." But I heard him interviewed, and he said he said that was supposed to be uh, a novelty song, a gag. He said we smoke more more dope than any San Francisco band around. And then, in a later interview, years later, I heard him say that that that's actually the way they felt that they did not think that dope was good and all the so. Yeah. So it's it's kind of the don't listen to uh, to hype. But I I got to see Merle Haggard uh, opening for the Rolling Stones of all people. You would. But that's kind of odd. Pairing. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was funny because we, you know, the, the the Rolling Stones don't never come out on time. You know, forty five minutes later, and I'm 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 there in the, in, in another zip code with seats that I could afford. Uh, the, I don't know, the eight or nine hundred. No, they were a couple hundred dollars though. I think okay. it'd be in another zip code. And one of the security people or ushers, whatever they call him, is talking to his friend on the, uh, on the phone. And he's a local guy from we were in um, Little Rock. He says, "Yeah, he says, I'm here at the uh, Merle Haggard concert, and and uh, the Rolling Stones are going to be here too." But anyway, I thought I could deal with a half hour or forty minutes of, of Merle Haggard, but I couldn't. Uh-uh. It, to me, it was so tedious. And I'm thinking of get these guys out of here. Oh but, well, different strokes, different things. Exactly. Yeah. But I, there's, yeah. there's some country music. Well, music called, now, Willie Nelson. I don't think I'd call him country. He's universal. Um, yeah, I like uh, w- him and Waylon getting together. The outlaw, I think they're yeah. the outlaws. Uh, Highwaymen. Highwaymen, yeah. thank you. Hey, by the way, we want to just let people know if you're out there and uh, want to text in comments, uh, 541-661-4098. We'll That's 541-661-4098. Operators are standing by. <laughs> <laughs> she, we just got a nod from the operator. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So, and, um, yeah, and back to, again, this is, I guess I'm going a little too personal on this uh, wide range, but instruments, my favorite, uh, are simply the guitar and the five-string banjo. Now, uh, it, and Kathy, you mentioned drums, percussion, yeah, that's some real, that is uh, very inspirational to hear. I, I, I Think of the Santana performance at uh, um, Woodstock. Oh, that God. young kid. That and, and there's so many great drum yeah. solos, but that one was pretty, he's pretty still, amazing. He's still around playing drums. Yeah, and he was like 16, 17, I don't know what he was. He was a young kid. Young kid. I, the story behind him getting together with, with that band was he was- Wait a minute, Santana has a lady drummer too. 
not just a guy. Oh, they didn't. That, they did, a, well, not then. They didn't but, know. No, yeah. in recent decade, last oh, okay. couple decades, oh. he's had a lady drummer, okay. and she was on like one of those um, awards shows, um, inducting somebody into some hall of fame. And uh, okay, yeah, she's she's even a Baha'i. That's probably how I was looking up famous Baha'is, and it said drummer okay. or Santana. <laughs> so he I was uh, he was just a young kid, played the drums, and he was going places. To be seen, to 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 get himself out there, and he was at some kind of event one time uh, playing the drums. And after the uh, the show, somebody from Santana's band came up to him and asked if he would like to to come sit in with them. And uh, the young punk, he says, "Well, I'll young punk, I'll, I'll have to have to check my schedule and see if I can do it." You know, so here he's just playing. Mm. Sit, sitting in where he can to to be part of one of the biggest bands in the world. Yeah, yeah. One I'm trying to think of the name of that song. It's about, um, I play it a lot on uh, my show. Yeah, and I should know it because it's one of my favorites. But right now, Senior Moments happen. Yes. It'll pop in maybe later. Yeah. Uh, oh, her name is Cindy Blackman, and she's actually married to Santana now, so, so. that's why she's his drummer. <laughs> okay. Or she was his drummer, and then they got married. <laughs> Cindy Blackman, Santana. Yep. And Mexican also, by fan. the way, time to, we just also want to let folks know you're listening to Curry Cafe, KCIW 100.7 FM in beautiful Brookings, Oregon, all volunteer uh, community radio station. We're always hoping and asking for more volunteers and help. So so music started to, uh, to, to become um, very political ar- around the time we were just talking about. Now, it used to be way back when there were songs like um, uh, I Didn't Raise My Boy to Be a Soldier, but been in a World War One song. There was a lot of World War One songs that were um, uh, anti-war. That, that and, I didn't know. Did, are you familiar with the song I just mentioned? No. Oh, well, that, this, this woman is singing. That basically, that's the, the words of it. I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. I didn't raise him to carry a... We got we got oh, a text. Wait a minute. The bell Oper- rang. Oper- operators are uh... <laughs> <laughs> reading the text. Okay, but I'm having trouble pulling it up Uh-oh. Uh-oh. right now, so we'll put it off for right now. Oh, we are, yeah, we'll. It's okay. Get back to that. I'll have you to, can't I'll have find to... a text. Well, we have. All right. We're all. I'm new with this, so yeah. Uh-oh. You gotta know how to use a phone, for gosh sakes. Anyway, we'll uh, we'll see what happens. So, oh, and then, and then there was the other one. Um, oh, I can't, didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. Okay. Was, was right. uh, kind of an answer to over there. And if you listen to the words of over there, they're just absolutely awful. That's another thing that music was used for mm-hmm. to gather up the troops. Well, sure. Be the be the first on your block. Make you. Make your father proud to have had such a lad. <laughs> Get your gun on the run. Uh, wonderful lyrics like that. Yeah, I think of the the movie with James Cagney, uh, uh, the Yankee Doodle Dandy. Yeah, I think that was where I first heard over there. Yeah. So and all yeah. these all these were big rousing songs to get people ready to go kill people. Yeah. And yeah. movies that come out at the same time. And right. John Wayne becomes such became such a hero in every movie and. Oh, but, <laughs> anti-hero. But yeah, well, in every movie, he was a miracle. Well, he, yeah, he was when I was a kid. And then Kathy did mention the women. I mean, gosh, there's a lot of women that have been, uh, inspired me. Uh, Shaka Khan, Bonnie Raitt, Linda Ronstadt, Janis Joplin, Tina Turner. I mean, a, a big influence with a lot of women. Oh, and one of my favorites, Chrissy Hind from The Pretenders. Yes. Different looking lady, but she's just uh, real... Uh, real sexy to me. They're the great singer. I really have, have always liked her. Back to the war inspiration uh, songs, it was Kate Smith sang. Oh. Uh, Praise the Lord and Pass the Ammunition. Yeah. Now, I've always thought that that, what? I thought Praise the Lord. To get... I thought it was a joke for years. <laughs> but, and then she turned out to be quite the uh, individual. I believe she was, eh, had some pretty racist views. Oh, did she? Oh, she sang, she sang a song called, uh, that's what duckies were made for, or something like that. Ooh. But it was also sung by uh, 
Who's who's the guy that had the great baritone voice, the black guy? Uh, oh, Barry White? No, 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 no. This is back oh, in the Lou 40s. Rawls. No, no, back in the 40s. Oh, man, I'm missing up. Can't think of it. Uh, it's... Oh. Okay, we're, we're, well, we're, we're going to... Okay, we'll, we'll do it. We're going to... So, Consult our technical staff so we can answer a tech. <laughs> if you thought this was amateur up till now. <laughs> we're community radio, man. Yes, that's, that's, we that's we a, do what we do. And if you think you can do a better job, you can come, come on volunteer. <laughs> well, I was looking for um, bands with mixed races, uh, you know, a diversity of human involvement. And Santana is a perfect example. But um, also there was the human... Um, beings or the human something well we have we finally made progress on our technical advisors here so the text yeah. that came in i'll read it it says please reflect on how festivals like woodstock and monterey pop spread popularity of the performers that performed absolutely and and the the music they were singing certainly woodstock yeah. was virtually all protest music i mean it opened, yeah um i can't try to think of the name of the guy that opened it Oh, you mean the the band or the uh, group? There's a guy, the guy with the guitar. Wavy Gravy and the no, uh, Fish, no, Country no, Joe and the Fish. No, no. Who opened no. it? Who opened no. Woodstock? No, they did not even close. They were two thirds of the way through. Okay. Sorry. okay, I can't think of his name right no. now. But there <laughs> was a lot of senior yeah. moments. But yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we just talked about that young drummer for Santana, mm -hmm. um, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, Joe Cocker. I mean, I. <laughs> I'd probably have to watch it again. No, I wasn't there like almost everybody else claims to have been. But yeah, it was yeah, quite the event. Neil Young wasn't there either. Crosby stills in Nash by the Oh, time. okay. All right. All right. Huh. Although I have read that he was there, but he wanted to be off camera, but that's not true. He wasn't with the band yet. And, of course, Monterey it's, Pop, uh, Janis Joplin. Yeah. Uh, and Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix, yeah. Uh, and... Uh, I can't think of the name. Yeah, but there was, there was some, some great stuff there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, and then about <laughs> all the genres, I think of Alex Trebek saying genre on Jeopardy, but from, uh, God, country, rock and roll, rhythm and blues, Motown, folk. Folk music's always been kind of a, a favorite of mine. Yeah. I, I do like folk music. And it's been the purpose of folk music, basically, was to point out Oh, yeah. Things that shouldn't be the way they right. are. Um, I put Kingston Trio, and I, again, as a kid, I had a little Kingston Trio record, and it was uh, Charlie on the MTA, and it had a little political thing in there about this guy that was couldn't get off the, the train. Get off the train. Okay, anyway. I can never understand why his wife could handle it. Hand, hand him, him a sandwich, sandwich but train not train hand him a Why didn't she hand him a nickel so he could get off the deck? <laughs> That's <laughs> another mystery. Yes. <laughs> Maybe she didn't want him to get off. That could be know. too, yeah. But anyway, yeah. Um, and so again, I've said bluegrass is one of my favorite. That's probably a an acquired taste for a lot of people, but I love it. And one of my, and I, I've never been able to classify, I call it rockabilly, the stuff that uh, Asleep at the Wheel, Dan Hicks and his hot licks, that kind of a thing. Not familiar. Not familiar. Okay, that, a lot of them came out of, well, some Texas in the Bay Area. Uh, anyway, just... Uh, the Texas, yeah. Stevie Ray Vaughan. I don't know. He's not rockabilly. He came out of rockabilly. Rockabilly is like um, Jerry Lee Lewis, but then there were other groups that were more mellow, less uh, yeah. amoral than Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah. Um, rockabilly is a beat, and it's it's more rock than country, but it's... Rockabilly. <laughs> well, again, that, Billy Rock. That's what I called. <laughs> Getting back to music, inspiring people back. Yes. During the wars, um, uh, there was a, a, a we had to sing these uh, uh, patriotic songs and get all hopped up and everything. And Hitler used it to a great advantage with uh, all the stuff he played. Um, cool. Wow. And. Uh, yeah, we had these patriotic songs that you had to go had to go off and fight the war. And then a lot of the anti-patriotic songs, well, some of us, and I know including you, were serving in the military at the same time. That that kind of threw me into a little bit of a tizzy at that time. Um, 
because I certainly love the music, but while I'm serving in the military, it was uh, uh, it just kind of caused some confusion in my head at the time. The music did? Yeah. Well, oh, oh you mean the that's music. Music. And Yeah, and they were talking about, you yeah. know, you're, get out, come on, all you big, strong men, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Yeah. So I hated that song. I hated country. For, oh, really? For, uh, I, was, uh, I was pretty uh, conservative while I was in the military and for years afterwards. Until I started reading some of the the real story of Vietnam, and then I said, I don't know. In a, in a way, when uh, when Trump calls veterans suckers, I kind of agree with him. You did then? I, no, I did now. I was a sucker to get sucked out of my uh, mm -hmm. my my cushy little civilian life to go off and almost get killed for nothing. Well, yeah, I. I, I... That's I don't think one. Trump was identifying with people who were against the war when no. he said the guys who were captured were were losers. He called them losers. Um, I, anyway, I was looking for a mixed race band. Sly and the Family Stone was one of the first ones, and um, they were very uh, yeah. They they believed in di they had diversity in their lineup of musicians. But they, I think they were another Woodstock band. They Who might have been out? there. Yeah, they were there. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Um, Speaking of, you know, events that spawned, if you will, uh, entertainers, groups. Um, who were some women at Woodstock? There was Janis Joplin, right? Was she there at Woodstock? Ossified. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they flew her in with a helicopter and flew her out oh, right yeah. after she sang. Joan Baez, for heaven's sake. Well, yeah. they're a pair, Bob Dylan and Joan Baez. In the 60s, they're a pair, and they're doing things together. They're appearing, you know, in concerts together, and, uh, yeah. Um, I'm doing doing more together, too. Diamonds and Rust was, was written about Bob Dylan. I, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, she wrote it. Joan Baez wrote it about him, their romance. Okay, we have yet another text coming in, another and let's see if between to six add, people in the building we can figure out how to get the text going. To add to what Kathy was saying, the text says, Cindy Blackman, who plays drums with Santana, started her career in jazz with saxophonists such as Pharaoh Sanders and Sam Rivers. Another Nice. Added, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. For adding, the, gold. For adding the the thank you for enlightening us. <laughs> the yes. Cindy Blackman biography. Thank okay. you. Yes. Very good. Maybe we'll. Thanks for the info. Maybe <laughs> it'll just take three of us to get a text next time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, in case you want to be one of the people that uh, uh, text, text, text our technical abilities, you can text us at 541 661 4098. And operators are standing by. And we're now professional and, and, text readers. Yes. We, we have, got through all the... We have uh, at least double. three people that know how to open that. Right. Thing. You know, and um, I've got to go here. I've got to have the... Uh, do, what they call this? Uh, what do you call that when you... Oh, now I'm, I'm having my senior moment. Praise. Anyway, KCIW. In my, I've been here now about a year. And my music... Ha taste changed a little bit just from being here at KCIW through I'm going to mention our fearless leader Ray across from me with his two shows Moondog and What's Going On uh, Shirley Hyatt who usually is here not here today she has Stardust and um, mostly Bluegrass of course I love but she introduced me to these people from the 30s and the 40s I kind of some I didn't know the Boswell sisters I've really become a fan of them Cab Calloway, uh, that kind of music. And then the other uh, one, uh, our, our volunteer Doug Hansen with his show Desert Island, which I've chimed in. He's played probably four of my uh, requests of uh, songs when you're on a desert island that you would take with you. It's just a wonderful show. And uh, it just kind of got me back into a lot of music that I mm. kind of fell out of for a while. I learned about music from my husband, Mike Justman. He was a New York Jew, and he had access to Greenwich Village and all of those clubs and coffee houses that were underground and in basements. And those were mixed race, you know. There were black oh, people are... and white people going for the music there. Um, 
they coffee were, house. They were mixed everything. I used to go to them when I was yeah. in high school. Yeah, smoking a little weed. Uh, Injecting a little heroin. I mean, people, well, yeah. there was Lenny Bruce. Yeah, there was hair. There were there were addicts down there too. But I mean, it was the more more laid back atmosphere than a, an alcohol bar. That's why they called them coffee houses, I guess. Anyway, he was exposed to all kinds of music. Probably owned a thousand albums through his life, uh, and lost that many as well. But he he introduced me to Benny Goodman and some of the early jazz that was um, it, it was very formative to me because that was the one kind of music I hadn't listened to in my youth. But um, Benny Goodman was one of the uh, one of that era's band leaders who mixed races in his band. So um, and Benny Goodman was a Jew. I don't know that he was a New York Jew, but um, that's a Jewish name. Um, so it's it's interesting how uh, jazz affected rock and roll, right? Anybody want to say? Um, well, a, lo- it, a, a lot of early rock and roll is is uh, group music, um, the Moonglows, and like I mentioned, a, a dozen of them. And doo-wop, and, yeah. Yeah, they came to like the Moonglows. Doo-wop is rock, yeah, and it's jazz. The, the, the Moonglows were, oh, and groups like that were, uh, kind of got their start from, from uh Groups like the Ink Spots and the Mills Brothers and people like that. I play Ink Spot songs on my show once in a while. They have some heard it, some good light stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Just no. I was going to say sixty minute man, but they didn't do that. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, and, and and again, both you and Doug and Shirley. Uh, not only do you play that great music, but you guys give a little background stories that I've never heard of before. Mm, that's interesting stuff, man. Shameless promotion, I guess is what Shameless I mean. promotion. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so my husband took me from jazz to doo-wop to early rock and roll, had all those records. Well, and uh, we moved them many times. But, of course, we also, he would go to the used record stores and trade the records, the albums that he had so that he could get different albums, because he was never, he never tired of different kinds of music. What an influence he had on me and on our children to, um, to love music of all kinds. And, uh, okay, we have another text message. No, but... not, not no, yet. We're not working yet. on it. We're Don't cons- worry about it. We're consulting our text we're experts. Consulting. Okay. Somebody mentioned Greenwich Village before. When I was in high school, I, yeah. went, to, I went to Greenwich Village. It wasn't from, that far from where I lived. And I went with two or three friends, and we, we we were kids from Long Island, suburbia, and we're walking around the streets of Greenwich Village in about 1960, 61, 62, and here's all these very strange-looking people, beatniks, and there were actually people sitting on the steps nodding out. Um, and we, we went into a um, a coffee house, I uh, the cafe wow so i don't i don't remember which one it was but a well known one we sat down and they gave us the drink menu and uh, i we ordered drinks and we thought oh wow we're 17 years old and we're getting away with it they're going to serve us that was a huge deal <laughs> yes it was but there was no alcohol in those drinks at all uh, <laughs> i was it was it was, it was about that. 8 dollars for a car, for 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 a uh uh Milkshake or something. Early yeah. Temple. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, we do have another text. I'll read it. Uh, our tech people got together. Have, thank heaven. So it says, uh, related to your comments about war and also related to music. My mom was a young adult during World War II, and she signed up with the YMCA and taught folk dances to the soldiers who were on leave in San Francisco. It was her way of helping out the war effort. Well, that's pretty honorable and cool. I yes, think, it is. Uh, like that. You know, and, 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 and World Thank War II, World, World, World War II, people were behind a big war effort. Yeah, we got to get the, it's, those of us who lived through Vietnam find out even difficult to understand that World War II, we, we were getting together and rah, rah, let's beat the Huns and <laughs> the Japs. And yeah, all it was uh, and different times, that's you know, for sure. Um, I ha- one of the thing about as we get older, I'm sure uh, our taste changed. After I uh, got discharged from the Air Force, I 
tried to take advantage of the uh, GI Bill, which was pretty good at that time. They paid you to just take classes. And yes. Minimum classes. So I was too much into partying, but I said, ah, I'll try to make some money. So I took a music appreciation class. And it was all about classical music. And I'll never forget feeling at the time, oh, I don't like this. It's so boring. And the guy was a good instructor, but he was trying to, he would play a piece and want us to pick out, you know, where's the oboe? Where's the uh, the flute? <laughs> but nowadays, and I do like find that very interesting. Yeah. I do. I thought, man, I wish I could go back to that class in 1974, I believe it was. Yeah. I can remember was with somebody when we were watching a band and I couldn't figure out who was playing lead guitar. And I mentioned it to her, and she didn't know what I was talking about, lead guitar, you know, as opposed to rhythm mm -hmm. guitar. Yeah. Sometimes you can't tell. Like the band I saw last night, every now and then I said, now, wait a minute, who's playing lead on this? I do that. I, I like to try and figure out who's playing the guitars. Yeah. And uh, it's sort of a, and who's the vocal, uh, before I recognize the band, or it might be the vocalist, is it singing in a different band? I love picking out voices and saying, yeah, I know that voice. Oh, yeah, that's Eric Clapton, or oh, yeah, that's Paul McCartney. I just said two easy ones to remember. But anyway, I love picking out voices from all the bands that I've listened to over the years. Okay, since you brought up the Beatles. Paul McCartney. Ray, Ray has a certain look on his face when he says Beatles. And Go uh, ahead. Great, great memorable songs like I Want to Hold Your Hand. That's, oh, there was but, the forgettable uh, ones. You know, uh, uh Rolling Stone every year comes out with the 500 greatest songs of all time. Okay. And that was like in the top 10. It was, was way the hell up there, way oh, that beyond all, surprises the, all the good music that's like number okay. 432. Okay. Yeah, I did a whole show criticizing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, what, what were some of the others? That, 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 they were just melodic songs, and they were okay, but... Uh, Supposedly, Bob Dylan said that he went to England and 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 met them, and he said, "You guys are doing uh, okay stuff, but you're not saying anything." And that's when they got more. He, he gave them some tips, yep. And then Revolver and Rubber Soul came out, and they had a lot more message in them. It wasn't just all about the girl who left me or the girl that I want that is with another guy. <laughs> that's life, though, isn't it? <laughs> that's what was, so they I sang about that. life till they were twenty. Two twenty-three 23 years old, and then they sang about issues. Hmm. But, you know, <laughs> back in that day, too, they used to have these phony gimmicks, you know, to promote themselves, like Paul is dead. And then there was, there was a, uh, there was um, hints in, in, in each of their song, and if you could uh, figure it all out from the, the hints in the song, there was an island someplace that you would win. They had a lot of phony crap, like, and and I thought John Lennon was a phony till the day he died, but that's another story. Uh -huh. Oh, really? Okay. Well, we disagree again, yeah. but uh, it's all right. Um, Give Peace a Chance was a, was a good song. And what's what's the other one that everybody sings? That they... Oh, Imagine. 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 Yeah, yeah, I had... Uh, Come I had... Together Over Me is also everywhere, even though, it, to me, it sounds like it's anti... Um, Indian gurus, you know, that's what I get from the song. But it also does sound like come together, I don't know, it almost sounds like come together over me. John Lennon is saying come together over me, like, you know, because when he said I'm not Jesus or, or I'm greater than Jesus. They were they were and, more popular than Jesus. All right, he did. He said I'm more, we are more and popular than Jesus. <laughs> he got a lot of flack for that. But, you know, he said I don't necessarily like it. It's just that's the way it is. Yeah. Um, so, um, well, they were current. Jesus was old school. <laughs> I was going to say, I think he was kind of like me, back then. To me, the Beatles have a lot of stress calming music, such I, as, um, Hello Goodbye, um, and, um, uh, You Say Yes, I Say No. Um, wait a minute, there's another one. Um, Love. All you need is love. Yes. I did that. I used that as a chant once. Um, uh, my husband was gambling and I was just like trying not to get mad at him in a casino. So I just started chanting to myself, all you need is love, love. All you need is love. And, you know. Did it work? He won and it relieved my stress. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's a good luck song. <laughs> but no, music is a stress reliever, and we need that oh, yeah. in these oh, times. Yeah. Um, when stress causes a lot of illness and inflammation, chronic illnesses in our bodies. And so you got to find your meditation music. And that could be meditation music is like in, in every kind of music. It's in jazz. It's in that rockabilly. There's meditation music in every kind of music. There's meditation music in the didgeridoos of the Australian Aborigines. So it's everywhere. You just got to find it. It's in the forest when the birds are singing, the robins, my God, they're so beautiful this year. Um, you got to find your music, Well, it, the music of your life. And it can be a, a, a mood changer. I have one incident that happened here about three years ago. I was sick with something and cold flu, I don't, and it wasn't COVID. But anyway, uh, feeling real bad for a few days and just couldn't hardly get out of bed. I finally got out of bed one day to make a trip uptown feeling real bad, and all of a sudden on the radio came Tower of Powers, What is Hip? And yeah. that is one tight, uplifting song to me. And, I, man, I'm in there just, to, uh, I, I can't dance, but I was dancing in my truck and <laughs> singing that song. And it, it, I just felt better. I felt a lot better. I, was yeah. I feel that way about Higher Love by Steve Winwood. Okay. Yes. There are songs like that that will lift you even if you're sick with a sore throat and a yeah. phlegmy cough. <laughs> I was home one day, not feeling too good. I was kind of depressed. That's when I lived on Long Island. Things were bugging me. I don't know what it was. And I sat down to watch television, and the PBS show had the Manhattan Transfer on. And I don't know if Love anybody's em. familiar with them, but Love the, em. I by the em. end of that show, I was just up. I, I just They're turned up. me right around. Yeah. That's really cool. Elvis music has done that for me. Okay. Okay. Heart did that for me one day. It was like on YouTube, a whole concert, whole heart concert, and I'm like, Wow, I didn't know they sang that. <laughs> yeah, good stuff, man. It's like I said, it's it's uplifting, and that's one of the best things it's, about music to so me. Getting back to "Imagine," the song "Imagine," right. if, uh, I I think it's really amazing that that each year when the bubble goes up or down or whatever in in New York, uh, they sing that song. And I, I forward, are they listening to the words of what they're singing? Well, it's the Communist Manifesto for crying out loud, and it's it's. I mean, it's it's a wonderful dream, but these people are saying. Don't uh, you remember John Lennon said, "Don't carry a picture of Chairman Mao." <laughs> but he also said, uh, "Nothing above us, heaven, only sky." Uh, it was anti-religion, anti-owning anything. Yeah. It, was, it was, oh yeah, basically. Communist perfect perfection. Me per me personally though, I've always nowadays it's you can pump any or pop up any lyric to any song. Yeah. But back then, if it wasn't in the album, I I, I didn't know probably three quarters of the words. That, uh, really? Oh yeah, I was just not a lyric. I couldn't understand on the radio. Really? Yeah. For me, I, th I was I the one that was constantly singing something, and they would say, "What are you What are you doing, man? That's not even close." <laughs> but. That's just me. I love, what was, what was it on American Bass? I had a good beat. I like to dance to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I, ha I have to say real quick, uh, we talked about, or I talked about the genres of music. How about the two that I, I'm, I'm sorry they're around, is Muzak that you hear on elevators, elevators or on hold. Yeah. And God, uh, not a, oh, that's awful. Oh, well, oh, I know. Or uh, and I'm not a big fan of the soft rock, uh, right? The bread, if you remember bread. Yeah, I guess some pretty stuff. It just wasn't my my thing. What about disco? Oh, well, <laughs> I participated. I was a young man on the make, if you will, at that time. <laughs> so I had to, you know, put on some chains and angel flights every once in a while. I felt cannot, so uncomfortable. I cannot picture you as a disco. Oh, believe me, it's with chains not a, and a white jumpsuit, not a pretty sight. <laughs> it wouldn't be now. <laughs> I thought it would be then, but anyway, um, uh, oh, there was a couple of songs Donna that, that I liked, yeah. even the Bee Gees. Not never was a big fan of the Bee Gees, but uh, some of their stuff before they were disco. I, Kind of thought they were okay, but then when I did that stupid old Saturday thing. night, no, mm -hmm. Beaver? Yeah, Saturday night yeah. Beaver. Anyway, yeah, disco. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm almost embarrassed to have said that, but now it's out there. I, uh, <laughs> when when we were in our earlier days here, and I, I was more of a participant, somebody, somebody in the studio mentioned that they wanted to do a disco show, and I said, never. 
<laughs> Over my dead body. Well, there will be no disco. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, it's part of music history, that's for sure. It got pretty, pretty played and pretty big stuff for a while. God, every community had a disco bar and the ball spinning and all of that stuff. Yeah, I know. I don't know if Brookings did big, not, probably. Being popular does not mean it's good. Well, correct. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's, right. Right. You know, listen to some of the songs that were, were, were hits, and hits don't mean much of anything. Yeah, yeah. Chicago made horn bands popular. Yeah. And uh, well, we would go out, my husband and I would go out to uh, bars, not to drink, but because there was a horn band playing, rock, rock and roll horn band. And Chuck Berry basically took the sax away from the 50s rock and roll and changed it for the guitar. To listen oh, to some of the point. early stuff, it was... Much more heavy sax than, than mm -hmm. guitar, and Chuck Berry was one of them with these amazing leads that he did. Yeah, yeah. Probably the folk music also helped to get guitar into rock music. The uh, Pete Seeger and uh, the the other um, uh, and the popularity of the um, um, who did you say? You know the group you mentioned, um, folk singers. Um, uh, Kingston Trio. Oh, King. oh, yeah. There were so many strummers of guitars, acoustic guitars out there, and they were getting a lot of radio play and um, TV play. And I think maybe um, rock picked up on, well, the electric guitar. Oh, oh, it was the guy who invented the electric guitar. He was responsible for getting it into rock and roll. I don't think um, so. Peter Paul? Yeah. Not Peter Paul. Les Paul. Yeah. Les Paul. Les Paul. Paul. Les Paul. Anyway, well, well Les, Les Paul and Mary Ford did a very significant thing by coming out with these overdubbed songs that I, nobody had ever heard. It was, it was amazing. That's one person singing that. And I don't think so much it created rock and roll, but it kind of was a shift in the music. It changed from, um, I don't know exactly what it changed from, but it was a, a sea change in, in music for well, sure. I think Les Paul had the first soundboard where they could mix the music. Um, and eventually every band had to adapt to the soundboard instead of just taping mm -hmm. over. Uh, as um, I think I heard one of the Beatles explain, we used to just layer on until the tape was worn out and it was going to break and we couldn't add anymore. And then a soundboard made it possible to keep adding. You didn't have to stop adding because the soundboard was mixing it all. So that was Les Paul, yeah. He started that in rock and roll. And that was my instrument of choice, guitar, $15 Sears guitar to start out with, and then begged oh, yeah. my parents for a Fender. I don't remember if it was a Telecaster or Stratocaster, but either one in my life. How many rock musicians can say that same thing? They started out with a Sears guitar. Well, I think, Bo, I think Bo Diddley started out with a guitar he made himself. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I know Jimi Hendrix had a really cheap guitar for his first one. So we're getting pretty close to the end here. Uh, if you want to send us a text, 541-661-4093. And it's probably not enough time to figure out how to answer that text. Do you have one there? No, no, no. No, no we don't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now our operators are no longer standing by. Hey, this has been really fun, guys, uh, finding out what music you all like and uh, sharing our ideas about the influence of music. We yeah. didn't talk much about social influence, but we did talk about how it influenced us. Well, we, it's a, we can cover this subject again. I think most everybody can relate to music. Uh, and again, we are KCIW 100.7 FM, volunteer station in Brookings. Yeah, and if you want to do more than send us a text, you can come sit in. You bet. Uh, go, Always. Go to kciw.org and you'll see all the little boxes you have to check to become a volunteer and what you want to do. And before long, you could become a famous radio personality if you have what it takes. Not everyone can do that. But no, we find that out once in a while. So, <laughs> been fun for me. So Fun here. We are leaving. <laughs>